All right, everybody, this is Ross the Fig Boss. In today's video, we're talking about my best fig varieties that I grow here in the Philadelphia area. And so I love making this video every year. And uh, before we get into this, I really want to preface a few things because I think there's a number of things that are really important to know before we go into all the different varieties and talk about the reasons why these specific varieties are so special. Uh, first, I wanted to mention that the website has come out fantastic. I know a lot of you guys, we've talked about it a little bit in the past. I always kind of try to mention it in every video that I do. But go to the blog, man. There is so much great information here. And the blog has been taken off. Man, there is so much traffic on this website now. It's incredible. I'm so happy that all the effort that I've been putting in the last three months or so has been paying off all the changes. It's so beautiful. I mean, look at the website. It just is so functional. The information's easy to access. Um, and I just would highly recommend you put in your email address here, subscribe to our newsletter. I'm gonna be sending out a monthly newsletter to you guys, just to recap a lot of what's been going on in the blog and in the world of figs. And I think it's, again, another informational piece of the content I'm putting out regarding figs and all this work, not only does it increase the traffic on the blog and it's attracting more people to my site, to my videos, to my content, but every single thing I've been posting and how I've been really focused and why I've been really focused on creating content on the blog is because all this stuff is going to go into a book and that book is going to be coming out really. It's not that too far away. I, there's a lot of topics there's a few topics, I should say, that I haven't covered yet on the blog, but mostly everything has been covered to some extent. Then I have to import that into something that I'm going to create in Canva, which is going to create kind of like a cookbook style book. I know that's kind of vague, but uh, it's going to come out beautiful and kind of really at a certain point here, we just kind of have to put it all together. Um, and so that's my goal is not only to drive more traffic to the site, which has been, it's been doing so in incredibly well. I've been so pleased with it, but also uh, to finish this book before the growing season starts, or at least get the bare bones of it done. Um, maybe not publish it until a little bit into the summer, maybe, or in the fall, but get a lot, a lot of it done as much as I can this winter time. Um, so anyway, go to the blog, check it out. Really would appreciate it. Figboss.com. Uh, it's got so much great information there. The other thing I've been really happy with is actually the production value in this video. Like, is it the camera video quality coming out great? Um, I brought my camera from outside that we f normally film with. I brought it inside. Changed a lot of the uh, video settings. I've really learned through this whole process of making content. I've learned how to like edit video and or improve video quality, improve photo quality. And so I've just kind of applied that to the camera now. In fact, some of you guys even noticed it, how beautiful some of the videos have been outside. And that's why I've changed the settings on the, on the camera. Also, we added a light here that's right behind the monitor. It's a pretty simple fix, but it's made me look nicer. The background's kind of, um, you know, blurred out. And then even the microphone quality is great. I added a noise gate. Um, everything is just coming together. It's just such nice production value. I'm so happy with it. Uh, and that's kind of where your views and all that ad revenue, which really isn't that much, but the ad revenue I do get, that's where that's going, is right back into some of the pieces here for this YouTube channel. So that's it. Let's get started, though, into the actual post itself and so you can scroll down here at the top you just scroll down and here's where the new blog posts uh that i've created are we just talked about the unique and underrated fig varieties by the way which i think in itself i may even do a separate video on that um but today we're talking about the best fig varieties as of 2022 and so the other thing i want to preface is the climate that i'm in and and some of the characteristics that we're judging these figs on I think it's really important that if you're going to be saying what your favorite fig is, be really um, definitive on the reasons why and know why. 
you know, understand the reasons why you like a particular fig. There's nothing wrong with having a favorite. I think that's great. Maybe it has a great story. Maybe it's from your family. Maybe it tastes great. But why does it taste great? Is it the texture? Is it the flavor? Is it the skin? What about the flavor exactly is it? Don't just say your favorite. And then if it's a, for a performance reason, as an example, is a lot of the reasons what we're talking about today is performance, well, then talk about those reasons why. It just... It just seems a bit empty if you don't add the reasons why. Every time I always ask other people, whether it's in some of the fig interviews that we've been doing, um, I hope you guys have been watching those. I know a lot of you guys have been really happy with them. We've gotten a lot of messages saying how much they appreciate that. Uh, you know, people that I've been interviewing, they have their own particular favorite varieties, and I always am asking them why. And they have pretty good reasons. Like people like uh, Brian Melton, as an example who lives in Fresno in a really hot and dry place, which his interview didn't come out yet, but he was really high on Black Madeira and Borges Sot Noir. And the reason for that is because of their thicker skin. They taste obviously amazing, but their skin enables them to withstand that really hot temperature that they see in Fresno. If temperature is over 100. And so they're able to really ripen super quick and get that intense flavor and and they don't melt on the tree at those higher temperatures. So for him, that's some of the best figs he's got, Black Madeira. Um, for people like me though, in humid places, it's just a lot more difficult to get a Black Madeira. In fact, if I had a Black Madeira versus a, a Hardy Chicago, I'm sure Brian Melton would choose Black Madeira every time. But here in my climate, I would choose a uh, Hardy Chicago almost every time. Very seldom does a Black Madeira actually beat the quality of actually a Hardy Chicago because here it just rains too much. That rain really determines the quality of our fruits. And so if you get about 25 inches of rain or more annually, and a lot of that is in the summer or in the fall when the figs are ripening, you know, things can be rather tough to uh, get good fruit quality here from fig trees. You know, we're subject in the Philadelphia area to these hurricanes. They go up the Gulf Stream, they go up the East Coast, and eventually we get the remnants of these hurricanes every year. And so this year was rather dry. It was an amazing year for fruit quality. But I always say it, guys, that the best tasting fig is going to be the one that's usually the most ripe and at the highest quality, the most consistently. So that's what we're looking for. We're not really looking for the best tasting fig. Although I love the flavor, and so that's one of the things here that we're emphasizing. That's one of the things that I really pay attention to. I've always paid attention to that. If it doesn't taste good, what am I doing? But most of the time, if it's a really good performing fig, you're going to be able to get it to a high level of ripeness and at a higher fruit quality, and it's going to taste great. It's going to give you that experience of what a fig and what a really high-quality piece of fruit should taste like. And so... Figs more than other fruits are really highly subjected to their environment, um, especially when they're ripening. And so you got to really be careful and choosy about the varieties. So when I'm talking about today, the varieties that I'm recommending, again, this is really specific to my location. And I would say that a lot of the varieties are very specific for humid places. Again, people who get 25 inches of rain annually where, or more, where a lot of that is in the summertime. Um, so a lot of the East Coast, a lot of the Northeast, a lot of the South, um, you know, anywhere you can look on a map. You can really just look on a map. And so the East Coast, you'll see it's all green. And in fact, there's a line that goes across the United States. And once you start getting into the Midwest, it looks a bit drier. It looks a bit less green even in texas like you could split texas almost in half from east and west and so you know east texas gets a lot of rain and west texas texas doesn't get as much and it's almost like a desert there so you know depending on where you're at it could be very different recommendations and so if i was in a drier place and i got 25 inches of rain or less every year and most of that wasn't in the summertime, I would be focusing on really just the best tasting figs. And so a lot of the the you know posts that we've talked about here in this blog is geared towards not only what we're talking about today, but our prior posts. So, you know, we talked about the best new fig varieties in 2022, unique and underrated fig varieties, 
six varieties that rose in the ranks this year. I made a lot of lists this year. We also did a top 20 list last year in video format. I didn't have it on the blog. Never wrote something up. We also did the best new fig varieties of 2021. And then in 2022, we did a top eight list. Um, even prior years, I think, I don't know how long ago it was, but we did a video talking about my top three figs, which before we really knew a ton about figs, I said it was Smith, Azores Dark, and Italian 258. Remember that video? And so a lot of these, again, these recommendations are for me, from people like myself. But if you're in this drier place, as I mentioned, why don't you focus on some of the best tasting figs? That's what I would be focusing on. You know, if it's not really performance is my utmost um, priority, then the flavor and the eating experience has got to be my utmost priority. You know, if I'm growing in a greenhouse as well, and it's rather dry, it's controlled in my greenhouse, it's the same thing. Um, in fact, I'm growing specific figs just for that purpose in the future. I'm holding on to them with the intention of eventually getting a greenhouse that's controlled so I can grow these really amazing tasting figs in this controlled environment. Um, and so that's the post that you guys maybe want to be looking for is the best tasting figs is the ones that are going to do better in your drier weather or not necessarily need the characteristics that we're talking about today. Um, because it is so dry. Now the characteristics that we are looking at for humid places, again, 25 inches of rain, it's kind of a rough estimate right there, but you want to focus on first and foremost all the qualities that i talk about here and you can actually go up to the growing tips section up here and there's a tips for rainy climates thing that i've done and and this is just years of information that i've gathered about the skin the shape of the fruits the eye uh we talk about splitting the susceptibility window or the hang time which is something that i've really learned is such a critical characteristic uh that i did not give i think enough credit in the past it is the most important characteristic you can have because it doesn't matter what the skin is like it doesn't matter if the fig splits it doesn't matter if the eye is open i mean little ruby as an example is on this list that we're going to talk about today and little ruby has all the wrong characteristics but because it has a short hang time, it's made it onto this list. It always, almost always produces a high quality fruit. And so that's the name of the game, producing that high quality fruit and that hang time, that susceptibility window of just the amount of time it takes for it to ripen on the tree in that final ripening stage. If it's short and typically very short, we can avoid all the rain. We can avoid all the problems. We can avoid critter damage. We can avoid um bird damage you know insect damage all kinds of things um so let's talk now about the varieties themselves as you guys have understood now i think the climate that i'm in the recommendations the people who i'm making these recommendations for and then the characteristics that we're judging these varieties on um so you can understand those characteristics and apply them to your own evaluations that you're making uh, the first and foremost, the f I think the first fig we should talk about is Hardy Chicago. Undoubtedly, Hardy Chicago is really like the standard. It's probably the baseline of if you're going to grow figs in a humid place, I think you got to grow this fig and compare them all to Hardy Chicago. It tastes great and it performs great. Um, I think a lot of, you know, there's a lot of uh, people who hate Hardy Chicago and it's about the Hardy Chicago type it's about the Hardy Chicago source that you get. Where did you get it from? If you get it from a mail order nursery, it's probably not going to taste that good. I tasted this year in the city of Philadelphia, a uh, pretty well ripened Hardy Chicago of a tree that is like 20 feet tall, old. It's been there for a while. It's not very good. I also went down to the Jersey Shore, found a Hardy Chicago that's about 25 feet tall by uh, 15, 20 feet wide. It's huge. Um, figs that were unbelievably uh, at, a, at an unbelievable level of ripeness, and they weren't even that good. But the Azores Dark, the Malta Black, the Sicilian Dark, some of these other figs, these hardy Chicago types that I've tasted are actually really good. Um, and 
you can see there's a clear difference in the source of Hardy Chicago um, that actually is it's pretty amazing. Um, so for me, Azorus Dark has always been my favorite, and I just keep trying more and more and more. I did try uh, Red Lebanese Baca, which um, I think is people's favorites, or at least a lot of people's favorites, and I haven't really been enjoying it that much. Um, it's a larger fruit, and so what I really like about the, the three that I'm mentioning here today is that the smaller figs, the smaller hardy Chicago types, or even just smaller figs in general, they tend to concentrate on the tree a lot better. And so you get a better tasting fig more consistently. Uh, I have a fig called Norella, which is a fantastic hardy Chicago. I even put it into a 15 gallon size pot because I liked it so much. But it's almost double the size or considerably larger size than Azores Dark. And it just doesn't get that full flavor that Azores Dark does pretty much every time. Um, so for me, I'm like, yeah, it's it's nice. It's a nice fig to have. It produces a lot. It's a good size fruit. It tastes good. But I would rather have a Azores Dark in that 15 gallon size pot, if I'm being honest. And I think a lot of it again is in the the size. Um, the water seriously evaporates out of the fruit when you have a lower humidity. And so if you have a smaller fruit, there's less water to evaporate, allowing it to concentrate in flavor. If you had less water within a fruit, this is why dry farming is so important, not overwatering your figs, because if you have less water in the fig, you have a higher bricks. The flavor is more concentrated. It's like if you dried your fruit in a dehydrator, you're evaporating that water. And so the sugar content's still the same, but the intensity is higher because you're losing water and you're left with more of that sugar or at least more of that flavor in your mouth uh, rather than having water. So the, the smaller fruits, again, I don't think you can really debate that. I know some people don't like smaller fruits because they're small and people have some weird thing with small figs. Uh, some people just like the big ones. I, I don't know. But... You know, if you have a palate, you're going to like these more than the bigger ones in a humid place. And so something else that really has separated Azores Dark and even Sicilian Dark this year, I would say Sicilian Dark has a better berry flavor, but the Azores Dark, for some reason, is getting a earthiness and a dried fruit flavor more than the others I've tried. And it's pretty distinct, and it's always there this year, especially. I I've noticed it at least a lot this year and i've been really impressed with it and uh, i'm sure it's going to continue i don't know if it's going to be showing up in some of the other hardy chicago's so that's why we continue this trial we continue trying the other ones uh, to see if we're going to like some other ones i'm trialing probably close to 15 of them um, at this current moment so in any case that's kind of my reasoning for Azores Dark. I know some people have tried them side by side in many videos, and they say that, uh, well, you know, this one here is definitely tastier than the other one. Um, and I would say that Sicilian Dark, as an example, definitely has a better berry flavor. Even like Conde seems to have a better berry flavor than Azores Dark. Um, but, you know, there's other aspects of flavor than just berry, uh, first and foremost, but also. The size, I think, is just something that's underrated when we're talking about consistency of fruit quality. Um, so that's my like little rebuttal to those people. Um, but not that I need a rebuttal. Everyone has an opinion on flavor, and so you know, it doesn't matter. Especially depending on where you guys live. Like if I lived in a drier place, I'd probably be growing the the bigger ones, the bigger hardy Chicago's. I would grow things like crows and and Conde as an example, um, over some of the smaller ones here that I'm mentioning, Azores Dark, Sicilian Dark, Malta Black. Here's actually, believe it or not, a little comparison of the size um, from the Conde and the Azores Dark. Uh, look, obviously the Conde is not as ripe as it as it should be, but look at it. Look at how insane this is. Like that's just crazy. My friend, uh, this was at a tasting that we did. My friend Chris ate this really, really good one here uh, that was pretty much dried up on the tree, and he was just blown away. 
Um, this was his favorite of the tasting that we did. And it's obvious um, why. I just would like to, I think, invite more people over the house um, this upcoming year to get them to taste that fruit because I don't think enough people uh, understand it. And the other thing I'll mention before we move on to Celeste is that this Sal Miguel Roxo, I'm trialing that now. Uh, my friend Bill is sending me a tree. But I've never actually compared them side by side. And so it seems like if what I'm seeing is true, that it's a smaller fruit like Azores Dark. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of... Uh, contradictions actually in the variety and that my Azores dark is a dwarf fig it's definitely a slower grower grower than others and it produces thinner wood than others um so if sal miguel roxo is producing a lot of growth and it's vigorous i i just starting to wonder if um it's really fair to call them the same even though they should be the same by logic they should be the same but I just have not been able to compare them side by side to really find that out. And we're we're gonna find it out. Um, anyway, all right. So Black Celeste or the one are really my two favorite Celeste strains so far. And again, we're trialing about fifteen different Celeste figs. Again, for the same purpose. It seems like Black Celeste, as we discovered last year, I didn't get to try that many. And really, my opinions haven't changed this year because I didn't get to try that many this year um, because we planted it in the ground and pruned the, the heck out of it. Um, but my, my opinions really have not changed on it. Um, it is still, I think, the most intensely flavored Celeste that I've had in terms of the berry flavor. And um, I would say Stallion's relatively close, but... Black Celeste seems like, to me, it's like you're eating a Vila de Bordeaux or a Neruccio de Elba. It's got like a, a Bordeaux-esque berry flavor to it um, that doesn't really remind me of like a, like a basic sugar fig like Celeste. Um, it's more than just that. The one uh, I was really impressed with, we've talked a lot about on the blog, is that it has a really, really short hang time. Um, and so that to me is going to be like undoubtedly the best fig I've got. Like it would be hard for me to argue against the one if it's ripening in such a short period of time, even faster than little Ruby, faster than Rissoulette, which we're going to talk about. It's faster than black Celeste. Black Celeste even has a short hang time. I would say the Hardy Chicago's are about average hang time. Um, maybe slightly less. It has a short, it's probably the shortest hang time of any fig on this list that we're going to go over today. Um, and so for that reason, it would be hard for me to say that it's not my absolute best fig, which is crazy. Um, but again, you have to consider other things about like flavor, you know, it, it ripens the most highest quality fruit, the most consistently as Celeste should, I mean, it really has the best skin. Not only does it have a really short hang time, but it has all the characteristics that Little Ruby, as an example, does not, right? It doesn't have a, a, an open eye. It has a skin that repels water rather than absorbs it. The fig hangs right. It has the right shape. It doesn't split. It almost never really cracks, and if it does crack, it doesn't really matter. Um, Celeste is just... Incredible. Uh, and so I don't know why I consider Hardy Chicago really a standard because really the Celeste, if it is undoubtedly the best, I think what would really have to happen with the, like the one as an example, I'd have to find like a really short hang time fig that also tastes like much better than the one for me to call that the number one fig. And so that's what we really liked about Ferdino del Nord, you know, many years ago was that it, it just dries so quickly. It produces such a really tasty fruit and consistently at a very short period of time. Um, so we'll get to those other ones. Let's just move on to the next one here. By the way, we're talking about early figs right now. We're, we're starting off with the early ones. I'm sure that was 
probably would have been nice to have said that 20 minutes ago. Um, so Campanaria here is just, it really is always impressive. Um, of that tasting that we did, though, this year, um, and I don't want to harp too much on Campanaria, but it, of the tasting that we did, that was my favorite. And this is a tree, or at least the fig I had in that tasting came from a really dry planting I have in the front on the north side of the property. And with that drier soil, you just inevitably get a really, really high quality piece of fruit. Um, and, you know, if I grew a Campanari in a pot, which I have them in a pot, or if I grew them in different areas of my yard, the difference in quality um, is pretty incredible from just that front planting that I have. And so this year I was able to taste some really, really nice miner minerality from it or earthiness that I was not picking up prior. A lot of the figs this year had some of that, a level of that. And it's probably due to the drought that we had this year. Um, I hope it continues. Maybe it has something to do with maturity. But this Campanieri was like eating, like it almost like it had a clay-like flavor. Like I was eating the soil that it grows in. And so I was extremely, extremely impressed. And uh, that's kind of really what I want to say about it. Um, it, it also tends probably, it, it doesn't really split all that much to begin with, but if it is going to have a weakness, that would be it. Um, because it, it does have the improper shape, but it does tend to have a longer stem. And if the tree is growing well, um, and it has a lot of photosynthesis, the figs will have the right shape or somewhat of the right shape with the right stem length with a little bit of a longer neck. Um, if it's a slower grower, you're going to see more of those flatter figs and uh, it may split a bit more. But typically in the ground, I'm seeing a lot less splitting. It's It's been almost none, actually. I've seen none, really, from any of the in-ground figs. Um, but the ones in the pot... Uh, certainly can and so anyway this I would say there's mainly only a small bit of figs that have that earthiness um, but when I dry them in the fridge and cut them open skin side down put them in the fridge and very slowly dry them over a couple weeks uh, a lot of them get that earthiness that clay like flavor um, I don't know why that is. It wasn't really present before, but um, yeah, it's pretty noticeable in a lot of figs that I've been growing. Um, maybe that's mold. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know because mold can have like a, an earthy flavor. But in any case, uh, let's move on to Little Ruby. As I said, it doesn't have any of the good characteristics that you want other than a short hang time. Um I finally decided to add it to the list, though, because it just performs exceptionally well. Um, and the fruits are really not bad at all. They're really nice dried fruit, like raisins. There really are, like, dried figs on a tree that will dry on the tree within, like, four days, pretty much any time of the year. Um, you could pick them before a big rain, even after a rain, it's like nothing happened. They're just right back to their business. And so after Hurricane Ida, I had some really nice figs to eat off of my tree. Uh, it's incredible. I would highly, highly recommend it. Um, I don't know what else to say. It's, it's just small. It doesn't have a big name. But I promise you, it is uh, it is really, really good and worth growing. Um, and I think more people are starting to catch on. Um, it'd be nice if one of my friends, like, uh, one of the people who, you know, has been doing this for a long time, like would start growing a fig like this, because I think they'd be really impressed. I just think a lot of people are probably, um, uh, I don't know. They don't see too much of a benefit exactly. Um, but I promise you it's seriously one of the best figs, um, which took me many years to figure out. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of also the problem with some of these varieties and evaluating them. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end, but 
especially the Celestes and these Hardy Chicagos and Little Ruby, even even Campanier. I mean, most of them have changed over time. Almost all of them have changed in some beneficial way. And so that it's really difficult to add some of them to this list, solidify them in this list. Once they're in this list like this, we did a top eight like two years ago. It's pretty hard for me to take them out. I mean, I I don't think I can take them out because they already basically, for many reasons mentioned in this list, and they'll always belong in this list. But once I put them in here, I don't know if... So that's like the, the criteria, right? Is if, if I'm eventually going to take them out, they never should have been there to begin with. So a lot of the information that we're still gaining about other varieties that aren't on this list, well, we're gaining more information. We're trying to make a good and accurate judgment on these figs, and they just keep changing. It's one of the beauties of figs. And Little Ruby was one of them. It took me three or four years, three years before, like, in the ground, before it really started to impress me. And then finally last year, I just came, or this year, I came around to it. And that's like four years, I think, of this tree planted in the ground and i originally didn't even want it i originally had it just because like i thought oh well you know it's a dwarf fig and so i want to keep a dwarf fig because there's probably some good benefit to having a dwarf fig uh but turned out to be a really fantastic variety and so you just you never really know i mean some of these hardy chicagos they just end up especially the hardy chicagos they really take a long time before they get this amazing or better flavor than than some of these others um anyway moving on lsu tiger is the next and it's just the same story this year it had a, a, a much better complexity and uniqueness about it uh it almost never split it didn't split and it rarely cracked the fig to me seemed indestructible um it is basically like a two times larger celeste like you you could probably categorize it as a Celeste, it, it is obviously bred with Celeste, and it tastes similar to Celeste, but the skin is so different. Um, it has a nice, thick, and chewy, and sweet skin. The skin is incredible, very different than the pulp. This was new to me this year. These dried on the tree every single time. It didn't matter if it rained or not. They actually got rained on quite a bit. I just left them on there, and they just still it didn't even matter. They produced an incredible tasting fig, um, whereas many others did not during that period. Um, I can't believe it took me so long to realize how amazing this fig is. And again, it goes right back to like, well, I had the fig for many years. I had it in a pot for so long. Then I planted them in the ground. Then the ones in the ground didn't do so well. Then I had them survive the winter this past year because it was mild, and they produced wood. They produced fruit on older wood from last year, and it was incredible. Probably also the drought didn't, or probably helped as well. But yeah, I mean, it is just nuts uh, how much better this fig has done, and yeah, it just goes to show. Uh, the next one here is Moro de Caneva. I don't know how much more obvious this one can get. I think people are really into this one. Um, you know, I've been preaching about these figs for a few years now, and I think this one's catching on more than probably the the others. Uh, probably because of the the size and it's a it's a good commercial fig. I think this one's not going anywhere. I don't think any of them are really going anywhere. I'm going to be talking about them probably till the day I die. But Mora de Caneva in its own right um is definitely catching on more than than the others and you could just tell like it just uh, it, it just produces so many fruits it's easy to grow um produces really nice high quality fruit every time uh you can pick them a little bit early and it's not the end of the world that's really what i like about it similar to like the Adriatics. It's kind of got that thing going for it, where even in the fall, it's still going to produce a good quality fruit. Even if you want to pick it early, you could still eat it, or you can cut it in half, put it in the fridge, skin side down. You get some of the best tasting figs uh, when they're dried and, and in, like concentrated like that. They, 
become to like some other level. Others, that when you can get them to ripen longer on the tree, which is actually not always the case with this one. I don't know why. Um, it doesn't like to hang on the tree forever like some of the others and, and dry into, into a dried fig. Uh, but if you can get it like that and it doesn't spoil, it's really, really good. Uh, it's like candy, this one. Um, Neruchillo de Elba. I don't think anything's really changed. Um, I do want to mention, again, with all this talk about these figs maturing and how long it takes to evaluate them, this is one that takes... It's going to be a while. And I would recommend either grafting it to realize its potential sooner, or I would recommend um, planting it in the ground and getting it established. It's a very cold, hardy fig, actually. Um, it did survive this winter, and I think it's among the hardier figs I've got. It is dwarf, and so like Little Ruby, it's going to take a long time to get established. Um, it's early. It produces a Braba. Uh, and so one of the things that I think is a little bit of a turnoff for people is that in, dry, in cooler weather, the skin becomes bitter. And it's a pretty bad bitterness. You can obviously just eat the pulp and not eat the skin, but this fig really is meant to be grown in a warmer place. And it's meant to be grown in the summer. And so if you got a mature tree, you'll be able to do that, no problem. It is an early fig. Um, but some of the, the fruit quality at the end of the season is just not going to be that great. But what you're eventually going to realize is that the, the fruits are going to ripen before you even get to that cooler weather anyway. Or you're going to get to that cooler weather and there's not going to be very many left on the tree. And so anyway, I really like the flavor of it. Uh, it's definitely one of the better tasting figs I've got, uh, especially on this list. Like again, it's like a Violet de Bordeaux or a Black Celeste. It's got that Bordeaux berry flavor, and it dries super well. Uh, it'll be interesting to see this year. I think now that the tree is really mature, um, where and how long it takes for it to dry, and when it when it ripens in that length of my season, it should be right al among the earliest. Um, Verdolino, this is a fig we didn't really get to taste this year. We we did taste a couple of them. Um, I did a video or two on it, um, but my tree, for whatever reason I have planted in the ground, it didn't rebound from this, this winter cold, this winter dieback until like July. And so it grew like eight inches. I had a nice air layer as well on the tree, and that died. Um, so I've been really struggling. I did graft. I, I got some nice wood from the tree last year and grafted a couple trees. So we're we're moving. We're not really moving in the right direction, but we're getting <laughs> we're going somewhere, I guess. And so it really is one of the best tasting figs. It gets like a cold dom in a package where it performs insanely good. And so if I had to like replace the cold Nam with something better, this would be my top choice right now. Probably De La Roca number two, or maybe uh, Lampira one. There's a couple others that I'm thinking of, but I think Bertolino in the limited time I've tried it and had it, it is rather thick and it is just very good. Um, it's early, it produces Braba. It should be hardy. I don't know what the deal is. Um, we're protecting it now, this year, and hopefully we get some something significant next year from my in-ground tree that re-sprouted in July. Um, but it, it, it's just what I think comes down to is that it's one of the best performing figs by many accounts. I mean, there's a lot of history behind this fig, and there's a lot of information available that I don't even need to trial uh, some things. It was great to see that the hang time was short in my limited experience, and it was great to see that it's rain-resistant in my limited time with it. Even this year, with my limited experience, I was able to observe the hang time again. It ripens super well even in the fall when it's super cold. It's just going to produce a higher-quality fig more consistently, and it is among the best-tasting figs. So it's got everything. I would say... If the hang time's as short as I really want it to be, and I'm hoping it's going to be, this might be the best one. Like, 
it, it seems like it's really, really short. So we'll see. I don't know. I think if you guys are trying to find a fig, it's pretty, it's not really that available to be honest with you. Um, but it's very, very good. And so I would, I'm really trying to propagate as many of these trees as I can and get them established in the ground so that I can share this with people. Um, undoubtedly is just seriously one of the best. Um, and so now everyone's going to go nuts for this fig, I'm sure. But we've talked about it last year, too. It wasn't a secret by any means. Um, all right, so now onto the midseason figs. The first one here is Green Michurinska. And um, I don't really have anything new to report. I was really hoping to evaluate the hang time and the drying capabilities a bit more and a bit better. And also the ripening period. It did survive the winter time believe it or not. So it's rather hardy. Uh, but I didn't thin out the branches. I got a little greedy this year and I even didn't even prune it that much. I got a little greedy with the pruning, but, um, I decided not to prune it and I decided not to thin it. I was like, I just want this tree to grow as much as I can. And now it's, it's really gonna go through this whole winter pretty much unprotected. Um, I do have, some really, really small suckers as a backup plan that are covered. And those will get through the wintertime. Um, but next year, we should have a really good idea of what we're looking at with this fig. And for now, it would be hard for me not to put it in this list, I think. Because it is sort of like an Adriatic. It's sort of not. But it definitely seems to dry better and definitely seems to have a short hang time. And so for me, it's if you're going to put it in this... Adriatic fig category. Maybe there's a battle between Green Michurinska and Prosciutto, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. I don't know which one to put in a higher place in a higher category. Um, I don't think they're really all that similar, to be honest. But who knows? They could end up being similar, and then maybe one of them takes the top spot and the other one gets removed. I don't know. Is there any redundancies in this list so far? I don't think so. I mean, the only thing maybe that is redundant that I can think of is just like thinking about flavors, flavor profiles. And so maybe you could say Black Celeste is similar in flavor to Nerucciolo de Elba. And that's it. In terms of flavors, maybe Moro de Caneva is similar in flavor to LSU Tiger, but the skin's different on LSU Tiger. And so there's a nice place for that. Um, So yeah, I don't think I don't think there's really any redundancies other than maybe this one, um, or maybe Nerucciolo de Elba and, and Black Celeste, I guess. Um, so we'll see what happens. Again, I'm not really sure in terms of prosciutto. Definitely would classify it as an Adriatic. It it really does look like one and performs like one and ripens around that time and and does so well in the fall. It just there's a lot of questions still with green Michurinska, if I'm even going to put it in that category. Um, but yeah, it's definitely my favorite this year. And it, it, I got a, a lot of them that I was trialing this year and, and ripening this fall. And it just really produced the highest quality fruit the most consistently. And it really wasn't even that close. It's got a shorter hang time. It dries better and it intensifies easier. And for me, I'm like, okay, that's enough. It does tend to split a little bit, but in the ground, I'm sure that would be fixed or at least a lot lessened. And so I got really no problems with that fig. It's incredible. Um, Hatib de Argentile. So this fig's really, I think, still underrated. Um, I got nothing really new to add too much from last year, although I was able to really directly compare it to Smith this year a lot more. And so it has a longer hang time than Smith. I mean, Smith's got a really nice hang time, but it's the Argentile just does better. It produces earlier. It, I would say that it's got great rain resistance. It has a similar skin, believe it or not, to Celeste and to uh, Smith. Like they have that ability to repel that water even though the shape is not always perfect on it. Um, 
but they produce easier. Like they need less light. They produce earlier. So, and they don't taste the same either. The, the berry flavor on Hativ is a bit more intense. So I like, I think what it comes down to, I like the flavor more of Hativ, but like the texture less of Hativ. And so if we go down to Smith, which we didn't get there yet, it's unbelievably good. Um, Again, one of the best tasting figs, just like Hatib the Argentile, that's on this list. And so, I guess, like I was saying, is that the texture is really, really nice on Smith, but the texture on Hatib isn't, like, it's really good, too. Like, some of them, I, f- I find, it really depends on when, what time of the year these figs are ripening, and it's so strange. With more heat or less heat, or what time of the year versus other times of the year, they change pretty well. Smith is such a changeling fig. It just, I don't know what it is exactly. Um, It's just so variable in terms of its flavor and its texture. But some of the Smiths are like cold and om, very cakey. And Hatib de Argentil, some of them have been rather cakey this year, like a pastry. Others are very like syrupy and don't have as much of that thicker, nicer texture that I like. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if I could say like, I wouldn't choose one or the other. I would probably choose both. They're, they're different enough and the berry flavor is different enough. The flavor again, I like it more on Hatib typically, but again, it just depends on any given day, which one is more ripe than the other. And I would probably prefer that one. You know, some of these, I've already marked them with um, asterisks. And so at the beginning of this post, we put an asterisk next to some of the best tasting figs. And so we mentioned Vertolino and Green Michurinska, Tib de Argentil, Prosciutto, and Smith. They really are some of the best tasting figs in this list. So not only do they, like do I think that they perform well, but they also compete with some of the best tasting figs like that you can grow. Um, you know, I don't think it's that far away from a black Madeira, some of these, especially Smith and, and Hatib the Argentile. And even the Adriatics are really right there. Um, one of the newer figs we tried, the next one we'll talk about is uh, Rissoulette. And so Rissoulette, I kind of mentioned it in one of the best new figs i've been growing it's like a cold adam meets black madeira or um meets black mission excuse me it looks like a black mission it feels like a black mission but they made it dry super quickly and gave it a really really thick pulp and that's what it is it's incredible the hang time is insanely short almost as short as the one i was so shocked to see it dried on the tree it's such a short and, and quick date. Uh, it's amazing. It, it It is rather unhealthy, and so I don't really have anything to share. I cut it back this year uh, quite a bit. Um, I do want to examine my tree because I don't think I pruned it as much as I wanted to, actually, to rejuvenation prune it. Um, I really, I think, needed to prune the whole thing out to really rejuvenation prune it but i bent over a branch to to protect it um i'm not really sure who has this variety anymore i think i may be one of the few people that actually am growing it um rosalino uh this is you know it's not going anywhere we've talked about this one in the top eight figs that we did two years ago and so when I put it there again, as I said, it's not it's not going anywhere. It's there because it's there for a reason. And so Rosalino basically um, has a really really nice fruity berry flavor. It, the the berry flavor, especially when you get it to dry, and that's one of the best parts about it is that the fig dries relatively easily. Uh, it can really intensify and create this amazing flavor in such a small fig. Um, and it's very different than Hardy Chicago. I, I was not convinced. (laughs) Um, I was convinced after eating it two years ago, but 
it's more apparent now. I don't know what it is exactly, but the leaf pattern on it is very different than a hardy Chicago. Originally, when it grows slowly, the leaf pattern looks a bit more like a hardy Chicago. And then when it grows more quickly and it's, it's healthy, it has longer fingered leaves. And so that's obviously very different than a hardy Chicago. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, the problem is my trees are still young. I got one in a container that's doing well, uh, but I got one in the ground that's probably going to be a while before it gets to a point where I can get it established and start selling cuttings from it. Uh, we are trialing as well the hardiness of this one, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, Smith and Texas BA1, we talked about Smith, but just really quickly, Texas BA1, I was really shocked to see how hardy it was. We covered that on the blog. Um, I It did survive 6 degree Fahrenheit low this year. I think last year was 10 degrees. So I would say it's definitely a 7B fig. Um, is it a 7A? I don't know. Can I say that for certain? It's hard for me to to get there, but that means we got at least a relatively hardy Smith. Smith is really not hardy at all. Um, what I'm noticing about Texas BA1 is that for some reason, and, and Smith in general does this too, I, I don't know why, um, they both do this. They, they grow rather quickly, especially when they're young. And so you got to really protect, I think, a branch when the tree is young and then once that branch survives it, it starts to branch out from the tips and that growth tends to be rather slow in vigor and the horm the hormones sort of get their act together and when you protect those lateral and apical buds it ends up slowing down for the rest of its life essentially and when it slows down the vigor, it lignifies better. And Texas BA1, for some reason, just lignifies great, whereas Smith does, does not. And uh, again, I think it's in the hormones and just how fast and how much it grows into the fall, whereas Texas BA1 slows down, and that's pretty much why it's, it's hardy. Maybe I can get to a point where I can get my Smith to stop doing that and actually survive the winter, and, and that would be a really good experiment to see if that would happen. I I, I do think they are different. Um, I know some people have said that they see almost no differences. People are telling me that this fig Algerian Chitui is different than Smith when it looks exactly like Smith. And so... I guess I'll believe them because I'm saying the same thing about Texas BA1. But there's only really one Smith, um, at least in the United States. People worry about the Becknell Smith or some other strain of Smith. They're all the same. They're all from Becknell. I don't think there's going to be any epigenetic differences between them. You're splitting hairs. I have compared all of them for many years now, and I see almost no differences, pretty much. But I do see some differences in Texas BA1. That's for certain. And um, we'll see, I guess, next year, really, maybe in my mind, a bit more of a definitive answer. But I would, I'm definitely leaning and in the camp that they're different. My friend Dennis Johnson, shout out to Dennis, and my friend Brian Rodrigue have grown them side by side for years, and they say they're different. And so there are some people as good as people you can trust some of the best people you could trust their opinions. And so um, I'm in that camp. I'm not in the camp that they're the same. And I've definitely observed some different observable differences between Texas BA one for sure. So, but I'm not close minded to the thought that they could be the same is my, is my point. Anyway, next up is vagabond. We didn't really get any to try any this year. It's same thing. We planted all the really good ones in the ground and chopped them way back for cuttings, tried to propagate them, rejuvenation prune them. And so they're getting established. But in the process of doing that, didn't really get any fruits. We're bending over a couple branches with this. Really wasn't much growth this year. It seems like it's a dwarf fig. I don't know if that's just because... Um, 
it hasn't really it was a drought and it didn't really get that established yet or what but it definitely seems more dwarf and that was i guess new to me um but other than that i you know it really has a nice grape fruity flavor that i haven't really tasted in any other fig so for me it's really really tasty again it's got the asterisk there on it uh, as most of the mid-season figs do, I don't know why that is exactly. Rissoulette, I'm not even sure if it is a mid-season fig. It could be an early fig for all I know. And maybe that's why it's not got the asterisk to it. I don't know what it is as well, by the way, with the early figs versus the late-season figs, but Vertolino's got the asterisk, and that's definitely an early fig. So I don't think there's anything to that, but a lot of people have that opinion uh and then lastly is verdino del nord from vladimir Rocco or figoin um definitely the same fig and i just want to say like we talked about with elba and a lot of the others it just takes a while before this fig matures i have um really a couple trees now that we grafted um a couple that i rooted air layers i took and so they're slowly getting established it's it is a dwarf and like little ruby it's the same thing you're not going to see great results with this fig until like year four or unless you can graft it even on my grafted trees this year they didn't have the best fruit quality and we had a drought so i think um it just takes a long time guys for uh, some of these varieties, especially the dwarf ones, and I don't know what it is about these dwarf figs, but they just tend to put out better fruits. I don't know why that is for this climate. They're typically smaller and dry a bit easier, I guess. And so we've just been accumulating dwarf figs, uh, and they tend to be a bit hardier, actually, by being dwarf and, and growing a bit slower. Um, they tend to die quickly in the fall. Um, and so they they lignify better. I don't know exactly what that is, but I'd I'd rather them not be dwarf if I had the choice. But you know, it is what it is. Um, you never have to prune little Ruby. You'll never have to prune Verdino del Nord, and you'll never have to prune Aruchilo de Alba. Um, so I guess that's a plus. Um, but for in terms of establishing the plant, it just takes a lot longer. Even Hatib the Argentile seems to take a while. Smith even takes a while. Um, so you just got to be patient. I don't know what else to say. I wish I could give you guys the answer here, but you can certainly get some decent quality fruits on younger trees. It's just every year they get better and better and something seems to happen. And by planting them in the ground, that's my recommendation. They seem to go up another notch. Um, and then we have like, as we talked about with these, what we just said, basically, is in this section here because a lot of the figs in this part here that I think are standouts that need further testing and some of the figs I've talked about in the past and some that I think are really impressive like there's a new fig called Azalodo to me that really was incredible and some of the ones that we mentioned you know that are like new figs in 2021 which you'll find the link the best new figs of uh 2022 in this thread um some of these were really really impressive i just can't put them in this list yet and so i would like to i think they're that good saint martin bar malone as a lodo godfather was really impressive castel tracino um i just can't put them there uh but there is a huge number of them and so I think figs like Salame and Communa Small Black, are, they're going to be obvious choices. And Noir de Malone is an obvious choice. Borgeso Gris and Violet Sephora, I'm just waiting to get more fruit from them trees. My in-ground trees, just, they don't want to produce. Um, what else? Uh, San Baggio, same thing. I mean, a lot of these trees are in the ground haven't really produced all that much because of the close spacings. We didn't protect them in the winter time. They're fruiting on suckers rather than fruiting on established growth from the apical buds and the lateral buds with the right hormones. 
Um, even, but you know, another situation here is actually my Verdone from Nikki is a great fig, but the tree that it was grafted on really wasn't that great. It was not a healthy tree. The rootstock wasn't healthy and the scion wasn't that healthy. So I'm, I'm having to put like a tree like that in the ground to get it established rejuvenation permanent, to get it healthy, to then really fully evaluate it. I mean, there's so many like things going on here. Um, like a fig like stallion just takes a while to get established. Um, you know, some of them aren't healthy. Some of them are this, some of them are that. And so you got to really give them some time, unfortunately. Uh, Calderona, still not really well established. Marcelazy, or actually White Marseille is a much better fig than most people think. There's a fig I have called Marcelazy right here that is taking a while to get established. Another dwarf fig, De La Senora Hibernenka, one of my best figs, it died. I don't even have it anymore. Um, De La Roca, still waiting for it to get established. You know, White Triana, ever since I put them in the ground, they haven't produced that well. Um, so now we're protecting them. Now they're going to produce, produce, and now we're going to get a better evaluation of a fig like that, along with unknown Mitica. I should get some fruits from it um, this upcoming season. Same thing with Lampira 1. You know, we're, we're just uh, unfortunately not able to evaluate these, some of them, as much as I would have liked. And uh, I hope this time next year, this list because we've tried and evaluated so many more figs, this list is going to grow quite significantly. Um, if we look at the top eight figs from 2020, I just want to see this real quick. We have Verdino del Nord, Elba, Latif de Argentile, and Moro de Caneva, Rosalino, Hardy Chicago, and Campanieri. So yeah, these are all still on the list, you know? Um, and so now we've added a number of them different types of celeste um <clears throat> we've added little ruby lsu tiger vertolino green michurinska prosciutto rosulette and so we've added quite a bit um vagabond that may even be an, an additional eight more fix so this list is only going to get larger and larger and that's the beauty of it that's the work that i've been doing um, it's paying off. If I didn't do this, I don't know if people would even know about some of these figs. And so eventually we're going to get to a point where we've acquired a pretty darn good list of varieties for this climate that I think are above and beyond like so many other options. Uh, and they're going to become more and more and more accessible. Like Campanieri, a lot of people are growing that fig now. Um, Moro de Caneva, a lot more people are growing that fig now. Um, so that's the goal, you know. Um, I'm really excited. I'm just happy that, in a way, the work that I'm doing is benefiting uh, other growers, in humanity, in a sense. And so, you know, that's really the, the purpose here is to kind of document this whole thing. Um, to show you the steps of the way that I didn't just arrive at this with no, no information. There's nothing to back up what I'm saying. I'm telling you the guys, the why, and, uh, and there it is. So appreciate you guys for getting this far. Uh, sure. Not many of you did. And, uh, for those of you guys that did, that's really, that's, I really do appreciate it. We'll see everybody soon. Okay. Uh, check out the blog. I'm sure you've already done it. Hit that subscribe button. I'm sure you guys have already done it. Uh, we do have some cuttings for sale, and uh, we'll talk to you guys in the next one, all right? Take care.